I'm Theresa Tackock and I'm a first year core medical trainee and academic clinical fellow at Guy's and St Thomas's Foundation Trust. I'd like to talk about work I was involved in as part of my academic foundation programme and it's, it's about estimating the heritability of nickel sensitivity and investigating its genetic determinants as part of the Biomedical Research Centre funded Allergene Project. So allergic disease has been on the increase globally for the past few decades, and the hygiene hypothesis is often cited as a neat explanation for this, encompassing a range of socioeconomic factors that decrease exposure to infections, particularly during childhood. Today, 30% of adults suffer from an allergy. This is a major cause of chronic morbidity and lost productivity, as this Fortune editorial highlights. So it's unsurprising that the search for genetic drivers of allergic disease has become a key focus for translational research. When we think about allergy, we often think of the atopic triad of eczema, hay fever and asthma related to high levels of IgE and a T helper 2 skewed immunity in overdrive. However, we may also think about contact allergies, such as reacting to nickel, where a delayed hypersensitivity reaction is taking place as a result of T cells interacting with Langerhans cells. And the MANTU test is another classic example of this. So we're attempting to investigate the genetic basis of type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions as part of the Allergene project. This is a collaboration with the Twins UK cohort. It's composed of 12,000 twins. It was founded in 1992 with the aim of exploring the genetic epidemiology of common adult diseases. And the sample is mostly female with equal numbers of mono and dizygotic twins. It is one of the most deeply genotyped and phenotyped cohorts in the world. <coughs> so what data do we actually have access to? So thousands of twins have had very detailed clinical phenotyping from questionnaires sent out over the past 10 years. They've had full Illumina genome-wide association scans, and they've had metabolomic profiling, so measuring serum levels of metabolites using a combination of mass spectrometry and gas chromatography. And finally, whole genome sequencing using state-of-the-art next-generation technology. Specifically for the Allergene project, we've also patch-tested 800 twins for reaction to 29 allergens, and we've taken blood tests from these twins, firstly to um, determine total levels of total IgE, secondly to perform RAS tests to the 14 <coughs> commonest allergens, and thirdly to perform immunocap testing, which is the now the gold standard form of advanced RAS test, whereby you can measure hundreds of allergens simultaneously on tiny amounts of serum. So at present, we have access to and have therefore analysed all of the patch test data, half of the RAS test data, and none of the immunocap data as yet. But at this very early stage in the study, it's absolutely crucial for us to have confidence in our initial clinical data set, because this really is the foundation upon which each subsequent layer of analysis is to follow. So some of my work has involved systematically familiarising myself with the clinical data and validating its accuracy and reliability in order to move the project more towards omic analysis. Now, with IgE blood tests, there's not a huge amount you can add in terms of checking data quality. But with delayed hypersensitivity responses, there's room for error at multiple stages in the patch testing process. Now, approximately 800 twins self-administered this true test panel at home and then visited the Twins UK unit 48 hours later to have the reactions read by research nurses. So, digital photos were taken of every single reaction, as you can see on the right. If you look on the left, you can see a key showing that reactions can be graded on a spectrum from one to six. If you want to treat this as a dichotomous trait, you can class one to three as positive and four to six as negative. But a really, really tight data set at this stage could potentially enable us, for instance, to perform dose response type calculations later to determine, for instance, whether twins reacting extremely positively to an allergen have different genetic profiles to those reacting less strongly. So I went back through all the photos and scored all of the reactions myself using this key and then um, compared my scores to those already entered into the research database. And I identified 30 additional positive reactions, which I verified independently. And of these 30, 11 were to nickel. I didn't identify any reactions which were wrongly scored as positive when they should have been negative. Given that our 800 patch-tested and RAS-tested twins effectively represent a discovery cohort, what we're aiming to do is replicate any omic findings in a much larger validation cohort. And this is going to comprise at least 4,000 twins who will select on the basis of them self-reporting their allergies via a questionnaire like this. So again, it's key that careful clinical phenotyping has occurred because we want to select a sample enriched for cases which turn out to be true cases. So I've also been analysing the whole body of questionnaire data over the past decade on any question sent out over Twins UK to all of their thousands of twins on any question relating to metal allergy, eczema, hay fever or asthma. 
As an example, out of 8,000 twins, almost 500 reported having a metal allergy in either 2000 or 2005. But out of these almost 500 twins, 130 I classed as unreliable responders because in the year 2000 they reported a metal allergy only to completely deny having a metal allergy five years later. So these twins would not be prioritised for selection into a validation cohort over twins answering more consistently. So here's our current data set and a summary of the test results show that 23% of twins had at least one positive RAS test with the top five hitters led by House Dust Mite and Timothy Grass. And then in terms of the patch tests, 30% of twins had at least one positive patch test. And unsurprisingly, nickel was by far the most common, with 176 individuals affected. So given that we only have data, complete data, for the patch tests at the moment, and given that the nickel story is coming through strongly, we decided to focus subsequent analysis for now on nickel allergy. And this graph just shows the breakdown of those 176 positive reactions um, split between the first three columns. So why is nickel sensitivity important? It's by far the most common form of contact dermatitis, and in response to this, the 1994 European Nickel Directive banned the use of nickel in various products, including coins. But it is still the primary determinant of contact allergy prevalence in the general population, in both children and adults, and it still causes significant morbidity, as showcased by these photos. There are an absolute plethora of patient advice, self-help, self-help, um, websites dedicated to advising people on how to live a nickel-free life. So we wanted to start by determining whether nickel allergy is heritable. Now one of the beauties of a classical twin study is that it provides an ideal setting for dissecting the relative contributions of genetics and environment. And the rationale for this is obviously that MZ twins share all of their genes and also early environments, whereas DZ twins share approximately 50% of their genes, but they normally share early environment too. So if MZ twins resemble each other more for a disease than DZ twins, then genetic factors are likely to be at play. The easiest way to model this is using a two by two table looking at concordance and discordance within twin pairs. So here A represents concordant pairs for a negative reaction, B and C represents discordant pairs, and D represents concordant pairs, pairs for a positive reaction. And concordance is calculated as D over B plus C plus D, and from that value, you can calculate something called case-word concordance, which is a very similar value. So just to recap, we've calculated a figure called case-word concordance from concordance, and you can see that 50% of MZ pairs were concordant for a positive response, compared to 30% of DZ pairs. So this gives an MZ to DZ ratio of 1.7, which is quite significant for a dichotomous trait. And if you use the case-word concordance figures to calculate correlation coefficients, and multiply the difference between them by two, you get a rough heritability estimate of 54%. Now, most complex traits that are heritable have values of between 50 and 60%. So our findings are in line with this. And for comparison, here is a graph showing a wide range of complex traits with their heritabilities. And although they're not listed, I can tell you that asthma sits at about 70%, and um, total IgE and eczema sit at about 60%. We also noted a significant negative correlation between nickel sensitivity and age. So in other words, the older a twin was, the less likely um, he or she was to, um, to have a positive patch test to nickel. And this fits with, current con with concepts relating to immune ageing and immunosenescence and may warrant a future study in itself. Once we'd analysed the clinical data, the, the statistics team were able to run a metabolomics profile relating to twins positive for nickel allergy. And in essence, unusually high effect sizes for metabolomic traits can potentially offer clues about underlying molecular biology. So our profiling showed that the most associated or abundant metabolite was isovalerate, which is a volatile fatty acid, a component of fatty acid metabolism. But we don't know if the metabolite change is caused by nickel allergy. And so to try to say something about causality, we therefore put we therefore performed a GWAS, a genome-wide association scan. And this showed, this is to look for common genetic variants associated with the abundance of isovalerate. Mm -hmm. So um, the two strongest associations were with a SNP of ANO6 and a variant of CAMK1D. Functionally, ANO6 encodes a transmembrane protein that's involved in glycolipid exposure on the cell surface. And CAMK1D encodes a protein kinase that may regulate granulocyte function. 
And ANO6 has been described in ankylosing spondylitis, and CAMK1D has been implicated in type 2 diabetes, but neither has been previously described in, in the setting of nickel sensitivity. So in summary, this very preliminary analysis has already highlighted possible SNPs in coding regions that are already known to relate to autoimmune or metabolic disease. And we, we hope to form similar work with our atopic data in order to potentially make discoveries which would allow us to elucidate underlying mechanisms of allergic disease, um, think about predicting allergic disease, and indeed, eventually, possible thera targeted therapy. So this is a very, very early study in its infancy, and there's lots of work both ongoing and planned for the future. So the first step is that we would need to replicate these findings in a much larger validation cohort. We need to look at our IgE data on ATP and think about whether it shows heritability in this context and whether, indeed, there's a relationship between type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity. Is there a counterbalance that causes one to negatively affect the other? That's been a subject of controversy in the past. We've only looked at GWAS data, so we can also look at the deep sequencing data, which will require a huge amount of statistical clout and is something that we are just thinking about now. And finally, I'm working on expanding the bioresource of, of our patients into the non-twin setting. So asking patient volunteers from the Skin Allergy Clinic at St. Thomas's to come and provide some, some more cases. So there are various people to thank, but mo they're mostly from Twins UK and my own supervisor who's based in the Institute of Dermatology at St. Thomas's. Thank you very much.